The majestic Great Wall wound through the mountainous northern borderlands of the Ming Dynasty. 7,300 kilometers long and strengthened 18 times between 1451 and the mid-16th century, the Ming Great Wall ran from the Yalu River in the east to the Jiayu Pass in the west. It was a defensive barrier against the Mongol horsemen from the north. At the same time, a great wall of another kind stretched along the southeastern coast. By the middle of the Ming Dynasty, it was supplemented by a chain of garrisons running from Jinzhou Bay in Liaoning in the north, all the way to Qinzhou Bay in Guangxi in the south. It was backed by inspection divisions, village messengers and beacon towers. The Ming government built this major maritime defense system to meet the ever-increasing threat of pirates from the southeast. The Ming government was under threat from both the north and the south. According to Western sources, an international free trading port was established in the 16th century by Chinese smugglers, pirates, and the Portuguese. In 1540, the Portuguese explorer and merchant Fernão Mendes Pinto visited the port. In his book, Pilgrimage, he wrote of it, the ports are two islands where the Portuguese used their commerce. And this they did with as much confidence and assurance as if this place had been situated between Santarém and Lisbon, so that there were houses there which cost three or four thousand ducats the building. This thriving port is also documented in other Western sources from the time. A place well known to foreigners, it was called, among other names, Xuangyu. Yet there is little mention of a trading port like Xuangyu in Chinese historical sources. The rare references that are made are quite different from those in the Western sources. Zhao Xianhai is a historian with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. He has found that Ming Dynasty literature rarely mentions Xuangyu or its prosperity, and that it only shows up occasionally on Ming charts and maps. It might seem that Xuangyu was no more than a small island lost in the vastness of Chinese history. But that is not how Ming commanders saw it. In their eyes, it was a stronghold of pirates. So where exactly was Xuangyu? Research shows that Xuangyu was located near Liu Hung Island in the Zhoushan archipelago. Today, nothing remains of either a pirate base or a trading port. But since the Chinese and Western records are so different, which version is correct? Should we believe Western accounts describing Xuangyu as an international free trading port? Or Ming government records that say it was a pirate stronghold? It may have been both. In the 1360s, a civil war broke out in Japan. Exiled Japanese warriors and bankrupt farmers took to raiding China's coastline. Meanwhile, Zhu Yanzhang, the future Ming emperor, defeated the warlords Zhang Shicheng and Feng Guojun. Some of their men took to the sea. When the Ming government came to power, it wanted to end the pirate raids and prevent a resurgence of warlords. So it took the drastic step of banning all private sea travel. In 1381, Zhu Yanzhang officially banned all private trade with overseas countries. 
He insisted that not even an inch of board is allowed to enter the sea. Trade and cultural exchanges were now limited to tribute trade, that is, to officially sanctioned trade between China and its tributary states. This became the only way that Southeast Asian countries could trade with China. In 1386, five years into the ban on private sea trade, more than 30,000 residents were forcibly removed from the Joshan archipelago to the mainland. Only a few civilians and guards remained. Joshan and Xuangyu were left almost uninhabited. Ah,它是有一个时代背景的。今天呢, The coastline was in the end too long for the Ming government to enforce its sea ban. Gradually, Xuangyu Island came to life again. Its former residents never forgot their home. Many defied the ban and returned to the island from the areas they had been relocated to. Descendants of former residents gradually returned to supply the coast guards and the army. Fish dealers from the mainland and merchants seeking business opportunities also went there to work. Their arrival revived Xuangyu port. At this time, great changes were taking place in the world, with repercussions for Xuangyu port. Developments in seafaring and the arrival of Westerners promoted the expansion of maritime trade, and China was a huge supplier and market for products. Even as the Ming government tightened its maritime ban, Portuguese vessels were cruising off the Chinese coast, looking for one landfall after another in the east. In 1522, Magellan's fleet had circumnavigated the world. Even before this, the Portuguese had arrived in Guangzhou, but were expelled because they had no tribute trade agreement. So, in ships loaded with spices, they sailed north along the Chinese coast, trying to find trade opportunities and get a foothold in the Chinese market. Off the city of Ningbo, they discovered the port of Xuangyu. There, they took the chance of trying to sell their spices, and relations blossomed between them and local traders. From their profitable but illegal trade, an international free trade port was born. According to Fernau Mengers Pintu, the port boasted good anchorages and above a thousand houses with two hospitals and a large church. And, he goes on, it was generally said that this colony was the richest and best peopled of any that were in the Indies. Xuangyu was the largest port of its kind in Asia and was praised in many European books. Dang 但是呢,他們都有一個比較共同的目標,就是說在這裡進行一種貿易。The flourishing free trade in Xuangyu in direct contravention of the sea ban made the Ming government uneasy. A few men of insight were in favor of opening up overseas trade, but they were in the minority. Conservative views predominated. The illicit trade attracted foreigners and was turning the island into a trading paradise. This not only flouted the sea ban, but was in itself something the government opposed. It was aiming at stability, not unfettered local development. Consequently, a storm was about to descend on Xuangyu port.
On a rainy, windswept night in April 1548, the residents of Shuang Yu were still asleep, unaware of the danger that was approaching under cover of the foggy darkness. The government had appointed the Grand Coordinator of Zhejiang, General Zhu Wan, to destroy Xuang Yu port as soon as possible. Zhu Wan's fleet surrounded the island. By the following dawn, the smugglers and traders had fled. Hundreds of residents either drowned or were executed by the Ming army. Zhu Wan also ordered the north-south channel leading to the port to be blocked with wood and stone, making it impossible for ships to enter. Many foreign merchant vessels were unaware of the port's destruction and were still making their way there. In the month following Zhu Wan's onslaught, 1,290 foreign merchant vessels arrived in Shuang Yu, only to find the port in ruins. The destruction of Shuang Yu brought no honor to the commander in charge of the crackdown. Zhu Wan had begun his career as an imperial scholar in the Ming bureaucracy. As the general in charge of coastal defense, he vowed to clear pirates from Ming territorial waters. After the destruction of Xuang Yu, he led the army south to Fujian. After a raid on Zoma Shi, he beheaded all 96 Chinese merchants who had been caught violating the maritime ban. This merciless brutality damaged the livelihoods not just of ordinary people, but also of powerful families and aristocrats. The repercussions were far-reaching. Officials from Fujian and Zhejiang and the imperial censor Chen Zhode impeached him for exceeding his authority, and the emperor dismissed him. Unwilling to endure the disgrace of standing trial, he committed suicide. Because 很多就福建浙江沿海的那个世家大族，他们自此的，因为他们从中获获利了，所以朱文实行严格的那个禁窝的那种政策，最后等于是他们的财路会会会会受到影响。after its destruction, the port of Xuang Yu played no further part in international trade. It was deserted for good. At the same time, in the north, beyond the Great Wall and far away from the sea, a new city was emerging, Huhot. Its founder stamped his name, as well as the name of the city, into the pages of history. He was the leader of the Tumed Mongols, Altan Khan. His grandfather, Dayan Khan, had attempted to regain the glory of the Yuan dynasty. Altan Khan inherited power from his grandfather, father and brothers, reunified the Tumed tribes and occupied the northeastern region of Hertau. In 1534, aged 28, he made an important decision. At a frontier fortress of the Great Wall, he requested permission to participate in the tribute trade system. Because Altan Khan occupied the fertile Tumed Plain in the Midwestern region of southern Mongolia. But in supporting the 100,000 nomads who relied on a single product economy, namely livestock, the region was becoming overstretched. Traditionally, if the Mongols needed resources and food from the Han region, there were only two ways to get them, either by peaceful tribute trading or by raiding and pillaging. Of the two methods, pillaging was generally considered easier and more profitable. 
But Altan Khan hoped to engage in peaceful bilateral trade. He held out an olive branch to the Ming dynasty. But he received a cool response. Uh, the Ming rulers had seized power from the Yuan dynasty and remained wary of the Mongol aristocracy in the north. A number of ministers knew what the stakes were and they wanted to open a tribute system with Altan Khan. But the judging emperor was against it. Deferring to the emperor, the ministers reversed their position, declaring that the Mongols' request to pay tribute was not genuine, but only a ruse to gain more time to invade the borderlands. Because of that, the request should be denied. Furthermore, the Ming Emperor and his ministers believed that trade between the Ming government and a satellite state in Mongolia could upset the hierarchical order and undermine China's standing. Most importantly, trade could make the Tumid arrogant and weaken the Ming government's control of the Mongolian tribes. As a result, the Jiajing Emperor, who was the same age as Altan Khan, quickly rejected his request. Moreover, in 1542, he ordered the execution of Shi Qianzhe, the envoy who had brought the request. With his request rejected, pillaging became Altan Khan's only option. The border towns of Shenfu, Datung, Yansui, and Ningxia were all close to Altan Khan's territory, and they were often raided. Without a peaceful means of exchanging goods, war became an important way for the nomads to acquire agricultural materials. Over the following decade, Altan Khan used both peaceful and forceful means to press his case, to pay tribute and to trade with the Ming dynasty. His persistence stemmed from the worrying position in which he found himself. The Tumed's territory bordered on the fearless Urian Kai in the north, the Chahas in the east, and the long-standing enemy of the eastern Mongols, the Oirats in the northwest. Altan Khan was always aware of the threat that they posed to his rear. So after each of his raids across the Ming border, he would quickly withdraw. He hoped that the economic benefits of trade with the Ming would allow him to extend his rule over the grasslands. These conflicting factors meant that the fighting between Altan Khan and the Ming government was intermittent, stop and go. To realize his dream of trade with the Ming, he faced a long, difficult journey. In response to Altan Khan's incursions, the Ming dynasty went on strengthening the Great Wall. The Ming Great Wall was mostly built of brick, except for the area west of the Yellow River, where it was made of rammed earth. Even there, the estimated cost of construction was still one tail of silver per metre. The financial and labour costs of strengthening the entire Great Wall can only be imagined. The Ming government was spending record amounts on the military and resources to prevent the Mongols from moving south. Altan Khan, also at great expense, was continually invading the Ming borderlands, trying to compel the Ming to offer him opportunities or reopen the Silk Road. The two sides had fallen into a vicious circle. For Altan Khan, it was a deadly impasse. If it continued, the Tumid might collapse for lack of resources. So he decided to force the Ming dynasty to submit. In August 1550, after his offers of tribute had been rejected many times, and after many fruitless border clashes, 
Altan Khan invaded the Ming Dynasty. He led his army through Shenfu and Jizhou, crossed Gubeko, surrounded Shunyi, and besieged Beijing. The Mongols plundered the vicinity of the capital. Their purpose was to force the Ming government to permit barter trade. Altan Khan sent a clear message to the Ming government that as long as trade was permitted, the siege would be lifted. Beijing was shocked by the siege. It was the second Mongol attack the city had suffered since the Battle of Tumu. Faced with such sustained military pressure, the Jiajing Emperor recognized that continued refusal of Altan Khan's request would mean long-term warfare. So he provisionally approved the request. In April 1551, the long-awaited horse trading market finally opened in Datong. The Ming government later opened up markets in Shenfu, with further plans for markets in Yensui and Ningxia. Seeing the harmonious and peaceful atmosphere in the markets, Altan Khan had high hopes for a bright future. The trade ban had been in force for many years. Once it was overturned, Ming-Mongolian trade began to boom, a development that caught the Ming government unawares. Only the Mongol aristocrats owned horses. The ordinary farmers raised cattle and sheep. So Altan Khan requested an expansion of trading rights, seeking permission to trade in cattle, sheep, wool and animal skins in exchange for millet, beans, rice and wheat. It would have been a positive step for both the bilateral relationship and border security. But the Ming government rejected it. The success of horse trading was also sabotaged by some Han Chinese chieftains exiled in Mongolia. They feared that free trade would undermine their status among the Mongol tribes, so they encouraged their subordinates to invade the Ming borderlands again. Altan Khan was unable to stop them in time. Occasionally they raided the horse markets. The Ming government had only ever allowed trade with the Mongols reluctantly. Now it hurried to close down all trade, accusing the Mongols of being dissatisfied and of continuing to invade border towns even after trade had been permitted. The emperor vowed that anyone who spoke in favor of horse trading would be executed. The trade in horses only lasted a year before being shut down. All hope of peace now receded. Conflict resumed along the Great Wall. It would last for 20 years, with Altan Khan invading the borderlands and the Ming government constantly strengthening the Great Wall in another vicious circle. Altan Khan realized that with their single commodity economy, the Mongols would never secure their future livelihood through warfare. Rather than begging the Ming for trade opportunities, they had to establish an agricultural base of their own. He was determined to become self-sufficient on the grasslands by promoting and developing agriculture. As large numbers of Han Chinese began migrating to the region, agriculture gradually developed. A mixture of agriculture and animal husbandry began to appear in the Han Mongol communities of southern Mongolia. With the development of agriculture, villages were formed with permanent houses. These settlements, known as Ban Sheng, became the foundation of Altan Khan's career. The food they produced was almost enough to support the herders of southern Mongolia. Agriculture provided an important supplement to the Mongols' nomadic economy.
For Altan Khan, the Banshan settlements offered a powerful base from which to unify the Mongol tribes in the west of southern Mongolia, the Chahas in the east, and the Oirats in Qinghai. But Altan Khan had a far more ambitious plan. He was looking westward. He wanted to reopen the Silk Road and build an inland trade route through Eurasia, so establishing a free trade region in Central Asia that would be controlled by Eastern Mongolia. In the mid-16th century, Altan Khan's forces seized the Qinghai Lake area. His goal was not to plunder, but to forge the inland trade route. To the west was Bukhara, a major Silk Road city in Uzbekistan. Further west were a number of international trade centers in Kazakhstan beside the Caspian Sea, as well as Constantinople on the Black Sea, Venice on the Mediterranean, and Lisbon facing the Atlantic. In the 16th century, the world was entering upon a new era of globalization, both by land and by sea. Portuguese and Dutch merchant vessels were sailing across the vast ocean towards Asia. The destruction of Shuang Yu would not stop them. Instead, it opened the way for the rise of another free trade port, Hirado Island in Japan. However, the port of Hirado was not established by the Japanese. It was founded by a Chinese seaman from the Huizhou region, Wang Zhe. Wang Zhe was a pirate chief who headed a smuggling syndicate spanning Japan and Southeast Asia. He had always wanted to run a legitimate business, but because of the sea ban, he could not. After the destruction of Shuang Yu port, he and his remaining crew fled to Japan. This directly contributed to making Japan the focus of international free trade. Merchant vessels from all over the world flocked to Hirado Island, but more came from China than from any other country. Wang Zhe became a key figure in the smuggling trade between China and Japan. Ganbe 近代经济也已经要开始快速的发展起来了，他们也需要中国这么一个庞大的市场和原材料的一个供应力。Wangzhe attracted the attention of the Ming government because his actions directly contravened the sea ban. Hu Zhongxian was an investigating censor in Zhejiang. Like Wangzhe, he came from Huizhou, and he understood what was driving men like Wang. He supported opening up trade as a way to end piracy. So he decided to try to entice Wang Zhe to surrender and go straight. Hu Zhongxian sent two envoys to meet Wang Zhe in Japan and promised to grant his request for trading rights. After living in exile for so many years, Wang Zhe couldn't resist the temptation of becoming a legitimate merchant. Agreeing to help the Ming government fight pirates in return for an imperial pardon, he set sail back to China. In Zhoushan, he surrendered his trading fleet to Hu Zhongxian. But after spending some time in Hangzhou, he was sent to prison by the hardline investigating censor Wang Bungu. His fate hung in the balance. Supporters of the sea ban believed that sparing his life would lend support to foreign trade, which was prohibited. Supporters of foreign trade believed that executing him would be counterproductive, and they pressed for a pardon. At length, the supporters of the sea ban won the argument. After two years in prison, 
Wang Zhou was sentenced to death and summarily beheaded. This scroll painting by the Ming Dynasty artist Chu Ying depicts soldiers and pirates doing battle off the coast of Zhejiang between 1521 and 1567. After Wang Zhou was imprisoned, armed smugglers cast off all restraint and the southeast coastline was in chaos. Hu Zhongxian had to struggle to suppress them. For many years, Ren Junfeng from Taizhou has admired the Ming Dynasty general Qi Jiguang. He has been trying to solve the mystery of Qi's Mandarin duck formation. Qi Guiguang was in charge of defending Zhejiang. In Yi Wu, he recruited 3,000 farmers and miners to form a new, more effective army to clamp down on pirates. The Mandarin duck formation was his secret weapon. In 1561, Qi Jiguang led his troops into battle against the pirates of Zhejiang. In the Battle of Taizhou, he completely eradicated them. But many pirate strongholds still existed in coastal areas of Fujian and Guangdong. From 1562 to 1564, Qi Jiguang's men rid the entire southeast coastline of pirates. However, war could not resolve the underlying issue. The Ming government could not escape the limitations of its own sea ban. Under a seemingly calm surface, there surged countless dangerous undercurrents. Woko As the situation on the southern coastline improved, the Ming government also received good news from the northern Great Wall. From 1566 to 1567, Altan Khan's Bansheng settlements were hit by famine. Altan Khan had no means of overcoming the famine. A poor harvest and lack of resources could cause the fragile Mongol economy to break down altogether. He faced a dilemma. Should he go on with war and plunder, or should he enter peace talks with the Ming Dynasty to secure a stable supply of food? The Inner Mongolia Academy of Social Sciences holds a Mongolian document from the Ming Dynasty. It tells a dramatic story. In 1571, when Altan Khan was wrestling with his dilemma, his beloved grandson, Baya Achi, defected to the Ming Dynasty with his wife and servants because of a personal conflict with Altan Khan. Altan Khan, now aged 64, was very concerned. But Baya Achi's defection actually helped him to resolve his dilemma. By this time, the Jiajing Emperor had passed away and the Lungqing Emperor had appointed Gao Gong and Zhang Zhujing as ministers. Aiming to bring the decades of Han-Mongol conflict to an end, they used Altan Khan's grandson as leverage to have him agree to begin trade negotiations and peace talks. In the Ming 
张居正、高拱、张居正、呃，徐阶、王崇古他们执政，这从明朝方面就有意要缓和这个。从蒙古方面来说，安达汗经过多年战争，并没有达到目的，而且本身内部的矛盾爆发，所以以巴沙那来投降为导火线，双方接触，最后就达成了。In 1571, in a grand ceremony outside Dershungbao Fortress in Datung, Altan Khan was awarded the title Prince of Shunyi. His brothers, sons, and heads of tribes were also granted official titles. Altan Khan announced the 13 Clause Lungqing Treaty, declaring peace between the Ming and the Mongols. The two sides soon agreed on 11 trading markets from Shenfu in the east to Gansu in the west. Peace and the markets revitalized the grasslands. But at 65, Altan Khan was still not satisfied. He wanted to build a permanent city in the Banshung settlements to create a Mongolian base where his descendants could flourish. That city was Huhot. In Mongolian, Huhot means blue city. The city was laid out along the lines of Ming cities. The walls were built with blue bricks and the roofs were covered with blue tiles. So from afar, the city looked blue. In 1575, Huhot was officially completed. The Ming government had mixed feelings about it, but the building of a permanent city had stimulated Mongolia's development, and the Ming government had to bow to the inevitable. In response to Altan Khan's request, they gave it the Chinese name Guihua, Return to Civilization. Huhot became a Sino-Mongol trade center, and the political and cultural center of southern Mongolia. It was integrated into the Central Asian and world trade networks. In the past, we said that the western trade centers are actually in the Ming area. And now, the trade centers are being introduced into the Mongol region. So, the Mongol region and the Eastern region and the Eastern region and the Ming region 啊，还有和北方的这样一个呃沙漠这些地带，然后它这个经济来往啊，然后更加密切，所以说呢，就是整个蒙古草原也成了一个经济交往啊、文化来往的这样一个核心地带。As calm returned on the southeast coast, the Ming government started to reflect on its long-standing sea ban. It came to realize that pirates and merchants were related. If trade were open. Pirates would become merchants, but if it were closed, merchants would become pirates. To settle the pirate issue for good, the Ming government had to face this reality. There was also a growing financial crisis to take into account. In 1567, the government finally agreed to relax the sea ban. It decided to allow open trade in the port of Yugang in Fujian province, which had been the worst region for smuggling. To an extent, the lifting of the sea ban resulted from pressure from maritime businesses. From then on, private overseas traders gained legal status. Pirates gradually became merchants, and foreign trade began to develop rapidly. Yugang in the city of Zhangzhou became an important trading port. People's lives improved, and revenue to the state increased greatly. But the trade is not good. For the trade trade, including the trade with him, it has a good need for him. But it is not positive. The best way to open the trade is to open the trade. But open trade, as the Ming defined it, still had limitations. Only voyages in the East China Sea and the Indian Ocean were permitted. Travel to Japan was forbidden. 
there were restrictions on the routes of outbound vessels, departure times, and cargo. The Ming government was like a woman walking with bound feet, tottering back and forth along a country road. Neither the emperor nor his ministers were aware that the emerging Western powers were already spearheading a new globalization. Portuguese merchant ships armed with breech-loading swivel guns were crossing the ocean. Dutch ships had reached Java, and the Dutch would soon occupy Taiwan and the Pengu Islands. England would defeat the Spanish Armada and become the new global maritime power. Already the East India Company's vessels were ranging across the world. Under the Ming Dynasty, the Great Wall and the ocean tightly restricted the movement of the Chinese. Today, the Chinese have the courage and enthusiasm to open up and join the rest of the world. The Great Wall has become a symbol of China's national spirit, and the ocean is a lifeline for China's renaissance.